Next up, we have uh, Alex Linton from Oxen. He's going to present on the Oxen private app ecosystem. Uh, g'day, everybody. I hope you've been enjoying Monerotopia as much as I have. Um, so I'm Alex. I'm a director of the OPTF, which is the foundation behind Oxen and all of the Oxen applications. I've been working full-time on Oxen for about four years now. Uh, I'm not a dev. Prior to working on Oxen, I was actually trained and working as a journalist. Um, so mostly my work comes under the umbrella of like outreach and education. I work with a lot of activist groups and journalists trying to show them like how to use the technology that we're building, how to keep themselves private and safe online, how all of this technology can be applied. Um, so where did Oxen get started? I'll... Here are some of the things I'm going to be talking about. I'll, I'll give you a bit of a rundown about Oxen, what it is, uh, how we got started, a bit of a history of the project. A lot of people are aware of the applications, especially Session. A lot of you I've already connected with while I've been here, which has been really nice to see all of you that you're using Session and actually utilizing a technology, which is really cool to see. Um, but a lot of people are not necessarily aware of Oxen and how it interacts with Session, how it supports Session, or LowConnect, which is the other application that we built. Um, so I'll also go over some of the features of Oxen. It's not necessarily the flashiest stuff. I don't think it's the juiciest stuff or the most interesting part of the project. So I'm going to try and run through it as quickly as possible um, so that we can get into the stuff, which I think all of you will be a bit more interested in. Yeah, so Oxen got started back in 2018. It was basically a bunch of people who were meeting at blockchain meetups in Melbourne. Uh, they were really interested in blockchain technology and interested in how they could kind of push the envelope a little bit further. You know, around this time, I think there was a lot of work that had already been done in like transfer of value, but they wanted to see if there were more generalized applications for blockchain. Um, so yeah, we are based in Melbourne. I'm sure someone will ask me a question about that later. Uh, but uh, around this time, we wanted to, with being the privacy advocates that we are, um, we wanted to try and have a good privacy-based layer. And I'm sure that none of you will disagree with me that Monero seemed like the most logical and best choice for us to do that. Um, so we started with Monero, uh, and initially we kind of were looking into whether it was going to be possible to build this on Monero. Like instead of starting a new chain and getting a new network, if we could actually utilize Monero, build it on top of Monero. As it turned out, for like a bunch of reasons that wasn't really possible then, I don't think it's really possible now either for reasons that probably Xano guys and Ruben have already gone across, um, and which I think he will be talking about a little bit later as well. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into that just yet. Um, but yeah, it basically wasn't really possible. So we decided to fork Monero, make our own chain and get working on Oxen. So at a glance, um, Oxen really has all of the you know basic privacy features that you would expect of a crypto note coin. You know, you've got ring sigs, bulletproofs, adult addresses. Uh, because we are proof of stake, we also have checkpointing. So uh, every four blocks, there's a checkpoint. And every two checkpoints, uh, you can't reorg past that. Uh, blocks with Oxen, with our proof of stake implementation, happen every two minutes. So every 16 minutes, uh, you're, you can't no longer reorg the chain beyond that point. Uh, there are some things which, uh, I mean, I guess I can't really exactly say that they're unique to us, but they do differentiate us, I guess, from the other projects in the space, uh, especially Monero. So we do have staking. Uh, we, at the moment, I think it's like about 1,500 to 2,000 USD, roughly, to get a full stake for a node. Um, you don't have to, on your own, do a full stake. Like you can do, an operator has to have a minimum of 25% of the stake and then others can contribute to their node. Uh, and at the moment we have like about 1800 nodes in the network. Uh, so those nodes uh, make up the services layer. So on top of, you know, securing and maintaining the blockchain and doing all of the usual things that you would expect them to do in, as part of consensus, uh, they're also providing the services layer. And it's important that it's proof of stake because they're doing all of these extra things which are not on chain and require a bunch of resources which you wouldn't normally have otherwise. Uh, we also, once again, another kind of boon of being a proof of stake project. We do have instant transactions. Um, our implementation is called Blink. It's been used for the last, I mean, I think maybe three years. It's the full transaction type in the wallet as well. Um, it works really well. Transactions were pretty much confirmed instantly. Um, I have never really had any issues with it in the use of many, many times. Um, and most important is the applications, which I think is the bit that everybody probably wants to hear more about. Um, so the two main apps are LocalNet and Session, which I will be explaining a little bit soon. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but I know that there is a panel about this later. Ruben just kind of touched on a lot of the points as well that uh, I probably would have made here. Um, but yeah, so Oxen, we had much the same as Fira. We never got 51% attack. 
but uh, we did have issues with centralized mining pools. I think at its worst, it was like 40% of the hash rate was in one pool. And luckily for us, like they weren't malicious. Like we were able to talk to them and cooperate with them to an extent, but at the same time, I'm sure everybody can acknowledge that having uh, 40% of your hash rate in one pool is not exactly ideal, even if they're not malicious. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I think proof of stake when it first came around, there was a lot of skepticism around it, and there was a lot of hesitation as to whether we would actually want to adopt this. Um, but as you know, more projects successfully were able to adopt it, and the tide started to turn, we'd been really eager to use the technology, and most importantly, it made sense for what we were trying to do. Right? Like, we had a hybrid system for a while, but eventually, people in the, especially within the community. And I suppose that this probably comes back to the psychology of, you know, stakers being more likely to be loyal and in the community and stuff. But the community really started to point out, like, why do we need the miners? Should we just move on? Should we become just pure proof of stake? Um, the thing that's unique and valuable about this network is really coming from the proof of stake nodes. Um, and so ultimately we listened. We have our proof of stake implementation, which is called Pulse. Uh, like I said, the blocks come out every two minutes. I think there's been like maybe about half a million blocks which have successfully come out of Pulse now pretty much with no hiccups along the way, which is good. Fingers crossed I didn't just jinx that. All right, and now we're into the much more interesting part of the talk. Um, so we have our two applications, Session and LokiNet. In case you're not familiar with them, Session is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app. Um, it's pretty cool. It has a few advantages over other messaging apps that you might be familiar with. And the other one is the LokiNet, which you might not with a lot of people probably aren't um it's a little bit more unwrapped we have much noise about it or haven't yet we will be in the future uh but loki is the reference implementation for our uh only routing protocol called larp uh, which we built pretty much from the ground up uh, which is also really interesting and has a lot of potential okay so session um so you know, around this time, around 2018, right, like there was, there'd been a big boom in end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps. They're widely used. WhatsApp, you know, was used by a lot of people. Brian Acton had uh, started the Signal Foundation and Signal was becoming quite popular, highly trusted. A lot of people were using it. But there are still like key weaknesses with pretty much every messaging app at the time that we could come across that needed to be solved and that seems to align with a lot of the problems that blockchain technology was trying to solve as well. Um, so, you know, a lot, all of these apps were basically centralized. You know, this is the case for signals, the case for telegram, WhatsApp, et cetera. Um, all of them were, uh, you know, your traffic is being routed directly through the service that are owned by those companies. Um, and probably the most important thing. And I think the people, the thing that people value the most about session, uh, is the fact that all of these apps require some kind of identifier to sign up, right? Like, and I think since then as well, this problem has become worse, uh, increasingly platforms are obsessed with trying to authenticate users and like confirm that they're human before they're allowed to use them. We're seeing a lot of like digital identifiers being brought out by governments, new regulation, new legislation, which is coming out, which is making it increasingly hard to literally just like text your friend uh, without having to dox yourself. Uh, so this is a huge problem at the time and arguably it's gotten worse. Uh, it's one of Session's biggest advantages. So instead of using phone numbers, we were like coming from the crypto background, it made sense to just use a public private key pair. Um, so your public key is used for addressing, your private key obviously is used for encrypting and decrypting messages. Um, and always those keys are just stored on your device. Like they never touch a server unless you send them to one for some reason. Um, and it's up to you to manage your own keys just like it would be with crypto. So people here will be very familiar with that. Uh, we have run into some issues, right? Because session is meant to be for a general audience, right? It's not necessarily people who are interested in privacy cryptocurrency not necessarily people who are interested in cryptocurrency at all. Uh, so sometimes you run into issues. People see this key and go, what is this? You know, like they're used to have using a phone number or even using just a handle. Um, and it can be very confronting to people. But slowly, I think that people are becoming more used to this. We do have some workarounds. Um, so we have ONS, which is a namespace system on the Oxen blockchain. And you're able to map uh, like a readable name to your, sig uh, your session ID. Uh, this is obviously really useful because generally speaking, you're going to have to, like when you're connecting with someone on session, you need to communicate your session ID out of band somehow. Uh, if you're in person, like I've been doing this a lot at the conference here, there's like a QR code in the app, you can scan it, it immediately adds the person, send them a message. It's really easy. It's not necessarily as easy if you're not in person. So if you're trying to connect with somebody who's in a different place or you just don't want to meet up with them, you don't know them, 
uh, then things become a little bit more difficult. And a lot of people do get stuck at that hurdle where they're trying to uh, figure out what the session ID means, how to use it. Uh, we've recently done a lot of work reworking the onboarding, trying to figure out how best to communicate these concepts to people who are not familiar with cryptography or with blockchain or cryptocurrency. Um, but the ONS is very helpful because, you know, instead of saying, hey, here's my session ID, you can just say, hey, add me, I'm Alex. Um, and the other thing as well about ONS is, which I think is a bit, a bit of, that goes under the radar, this, uh, this feature actually, but um, you can register multiple ONSs to a single session ID. So if you have like multiple pseudonyms or like different contexts in your life where you, you know, people know you by different names, or you just, you know, for some reason want to have lots of nicknames, you can absolutely do that and have just the one account uh, so people are able to add you and you can kind of keep that context going with them. Uh, so that's really useful. I have multiple ONSs mapped to my session ID. Some of them are public, some of them are not. Um, yeah, things are going really well with session. Uh, it was slow going for a long time. We ran into a lot of issues, as I'm sure a lot of you have uh, bumped into the problem that uh, developing this, or you just, sometimes it fucking sucks. Like, it's just really hard. You run into all these issues that you would never run into if you didn't, if it wasn't decentralized. Um, obviously, like the qualities that are provided are extremely worthwhile. So you persist through it. But we ran into a lot of issues, especially in the early days. Like session was a fork of signal. And so we were using the signal protocol, which has a lot of complex uh, like key exchanges and ratcheting and stuff like that, which really didn't work very well in a decentralized context just because reliability was so much worse. Um, so like, even though we use the service code network to store and route messages, uh, so you do have offline messaging capabilities, it's not as reliable as if I can just like spin up a server and serve it directly to you. Um, yeah, but, uh, things have been going well last year, uh, during Iran, in June, there was a civil unrest in Iran, uh, lots of protests, uh, lots of messaging apps and communication applications were blocked. Uh, the Iranian government's very aggressive at trying to block, uh, privacy technology. And uh, eventually Signal was blocked and that paved the way for Session to start getting a lot more attention in Iran. Uh, we had previously done a bunch of grassroots work with organizations over there, uh, teaching uh, activist groups how to use Session, what Session was. And so it was an app that they turned to when Signal, which is what they would previously been relying on, mostly, uh, was no longer available. Uh, that caused like a huge uptick in Session users very, very quickly, basically. We woke up one day and just had like 100,000 new users and we were like, what is going on? Um, so eventually after a few weeks, uh, session after like, obviously the, the government figured out what was going on, figured out that this application was being used and that it was useful, uh, and that they were unable to surveil people who were using it. And so then, you know, then they started the process of trying to block the service node network. Um, this is something that is an ongoing issue. Session is still usable in Iran, but only with a VPN much like other messaging applications. Censorship resistance is something that we're really interested in improving and increasing. It's something that's really core to our session's use case and the purpose of session. Um, but it is really difficult. At the moment, a lot of the circumvention methods are basically just like brute forcing their way through, trying to set up uh, servers fast and they can be shut down and things like that, which is obviously very inefficient, very resource intensive. And unsurprisingly, state level actors have much more capacity and resources than the people to the sensor. Uh, nonetheless, it started this uptick and Session has been getting a lot more uh, attention and uh, both in the media and from other projects in the space um, and just people generally having a high level of awareness about it. At the moment, it's really hard to actually estimate, um, understandably, the amount of uh, active users that are on Session. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we could get some kind of approximation because we have like basically no information about who's actually on Session and who's using it. Uh, but we think we have come up with a pretty decent way of approximating um, and this is a relatively conservative number. We tend to err on the low side instead of going on the high side because we don't really know. Um, but we definitely have over 600,000. It's probably closer to 700,000 at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's session. Then there's looking at. Um, so session has onion routing at the moment, which is something I didn't touch on before. Uh, session, all messages in the session are onion routed. Uh, and so... We currently use an a, a Onion encryption protocol called Onion Requests, which we developed ourselves, uh, which is relatively lightweight and efficient, um, and it works pretty well for what we're doing, but it still has limitations, right? Uh, LokiNet is a much more generalized solution. Um, it is network layer Onion Router, so it's below the transport layer, so you can do a lot more things with it, uh, including you know routing complex traffic types like UDP, 
And uh, that allows you to do a lot of things that are very cool and uh, unusual to be able to do with an Onion router, such as host a video call um, or stream YouTube or stream on Twitch or any other number of bandwidth intensive things. There are also a lot of other things that you can do. One person in the community, this is one of my favorite things actually uh, to come out of LokiNet, they built a router, like a hardware router, uh, which was LokiNet enabled. So anybody who connected to the internet through this router would be connected through LokiNet, which was very cool. Uh, looking at also has civil resistance as a result of the uh, uh, the staking requirement in the node network. This is something which has been like a very common criticism of Tor. Uh, basically, because there are nodes that are just altruistic. You can just spin up a bunch of nodes and just try and do malicious things on the network if you wanted to. Um, they have their own ways of mitigating that. But uh, yeah, so we have civil resistance thanks to the, uh, the blockchain. Uh, we have hidden services much like Tor. They're not called hidden services. Uh, they're called snaps, um, but they function very similarly to how hidden services work. So if you're familiar with those, um, it's more or less the same thing. Um, in terms of exit node functionality, so uh, obviously Lokinet is like an internal network. You can access snaps that are on there. Um, but if you want to access the regular internet, like if for some reason you want to browse Facebook or, I don't know, Reddit or something, um, then you can use an exit node. And that will uh, bridge you out into the internet. Uh, where you still get the benefits of the metadata protection from the unenrouting uh, part of the process, but uh, you're able to browse the internet as you ordinarily would. Uh, LokiNet also has ONS integration for SNAPs. So for example, you could have getmonero.loki, uh, and you could like mirror the Monero website on Loki, and people could access it privately through LokiNet. Um, yeah. So the thing about all of these applications is that they are completely free to use, um, which is very important and a core part of what we're trying to do here. And I don't think that our mission would really be fulfilled if we placed a financial barrier on people being able to use these applications. Uh, so that will always be the case. And it's really important to us not to roll back. So anything that's out there that's currently free to use will always be free to use. That's really important to what we're doing. Uh, we're not planning to start charging for things that are currently free. Um, however, even though these apps are free for the end user, they're not actually free. They're not free for the network. They come with the cost of the network. And at the moment, the apps aren't really necessarily paying their way. Uh, so we've been putting a lot of time and energy probably over the last year or so into figuring out exactly how we capture the value from these applications and return that value to the network in order to make the entire system sustainable. Uh, it is a really difficult thing to do without becoming really predatory and exploitative, um, but we are working really hard on this. Uh, so Session Pro subscription is one idea that we have. So Session has some limitations, right? Like the under requests uh, system that we use, for example, you're only able to send uh, file attachments up to 10 megabytes. Um, and that's basically because, you know, the network only has so many resources. The moment the network, the network provisions, but at the same time, you know, like it would be a problem. Uh, if we just let people send like movies across session, that would be not ideal. <laughs> uh, in fact, we'd probably just time out. Uh, but anyway, so a session pro subscription, theoretically, you could have power user features. So things like larger uh, file attachments or uh, something that a lot of people often ask for with session is multi-account, which isn't currently implemented, but it could be a pro feature or potentially if you want to have more than like three accounts, your pro feature or something like that. Exactly how this works, um, we're not exactly sure yet. We have seen this function pretty well with other applications like Telegram, I think, has rolled out a really successful subscription model. Not really saying that we're, uh, our ambitions are not to become Telegram, uh, but at the same time, like I think that it's interesting how they've uh, done their subscription model. At first, I was very skeptical that it would work, but it seems to be working quite well. Uh, the looking at exit marketplace. So the exit nodes that I was talking about before, um, I, I spent a lot of time comparing LokiNet to Tor, but in reality, um, I think a lot of end users are actually going to use LokiNet more similarly to how they would use a VPN. Um, and that's because like the actual user flow is more similar to using a VPN. Like you don't download LokiNet browser or specialized LokiNet browsers in order to uh, connect to LokiNet. You just download a LokiNet application, can run in the background in a system tray or whatever. And all of the uh, traffic through the device is going to be routed through LokiNet. It is much more similar to how VPNs work, right? Um, and so once again, in a, even a step closer to VPNs with uh, exits, you're connecting to the normal internet. Functionally, this is basically the same as a VPN, right? Um, so the looking at exit marketplace is an idea that we have to try and connect uh, exit providers uh, with people who want to pay for exit services uh, in a trustless and decentralized way. 
Um, there we have at the moment a proposal which we have published on our website uh, for how looking at exit places might work, but there's still some research to be done as to exactly what the implementation will be. Um, so if you guys are interested to know more about what those implementations are or what the proposal are, I might uh, invite people to ask a question about it later. Uh, ONS Marketplace, so not something that exists just yet, uh, but I think it would be relatively easy to actually implement this. Um, ONS already exists, the infrastructure for this already exists, and we've seen namespace marketplaces work quite well with ENS and also with, uh, once again, with Telegram. And so with that in mind, I think an ONS marketplace would be quite valuable, as well as potentially reducing the barrier to entry, depending on how the marketplace functioned, um, for people to actually attain an ONS. Like, ONSs are very important uh, in terms of Session UX, or they could be very important in terms of Session UX. Uh, but at the moment, the barrier to entry is very high. Like, you need to acquire Oxen, which is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. You need to take it off onto a wallet and then register the ONS there. You need to already have session installed and have your session ID and be able to map it there. There are a lot of steps, and frankly, it's probably too many steps for your average user to actually undertake, unless they're already interested in Oxen itself as a coin uh, or very invested in the ecosystem. At the moment, the barrier is very high. Um, I do know a few people, I've spoken to people who have said they would love to register an LNS, um, but more or less haven't really got the technical know-how to actually achieve that. The marketplace could reduce that barrier to entry, um, as well as just being like Ruben was kind of uh, alluding to before, kind of a bit of fun, right? Like, you know, you can speculate on names or do whatever you want. You can sit on funny names or there are lots of possibilities here. And I think people are already doing this with Telegram, right? Because it would be a similar dynamic. And the last thing is Session Enterprise, uh, which I think is probably the most uh, vague and also distant option on this list. Um, but I also think it has a lot of potential. I think organizations, uh, businesses, uh, you know, whether it be healthcare workers, educators, um, even government institutions, will have a lot of use for Session. You know, Session has natural compliance with a lot of privacy regulation because it's uh, private by design. So uh, that means that it could be very useful to all of these highly regulated businesses or just businesses who are concerned about maintaining the privacy of whatever they're doing or their employees or what have you. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. Yeah, so just to go back over all of this, Oxen itself is uh, privacy-focused crypto. Um, using the CryptoNode protocol, proof of stake, we do have instant transactions. But I think the much more interesting thing is the Oxen service node infrastructure um, and what we've built on top of it. Uh, of course, we have Session and LokiNet so far, right? But I think that, like I, like I mentioned before, the network can definitely handle a lot more than it is right now. What does that mean scaling up Session users or uh, more traffic running through LokiNet or adding more applications to the ecosystem? These are all valid options. Also, you would hope and anticipate that the network itself would grow as well. Um, and therefore be able to handle uh, more load. Um, there actually was one other application, once again, kind of harking back to uh, Ruben's talk, uh, which we considered, which was like a DeFi application, uh, but ultimately didn't end up pursuing it. But um, I, I, we're always open to other ideas. We're very focused on Session and Lokina at the moment, but if you do have ideas or if you're interested in developing on Oxen, then absolutely get in touch with us. Uh, and then of course, Session, end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messaging application, and looking at generalized IDP router. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say for now. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, uh, so the way I understand Oxen is it's a uh, private app ecosystem, or would you say it's a cryptocurrency first? Uh, I think our mission is mostly defined by the applications which run on top of it, right? And I think that the way that I tend to navigate Oxen is as a way to incentivize and enable that infrastructure which is supporting those applications. And it's the value of those applications which is then 
supposedly, going to be transferred to the value of the currency, right? Because it's the thing which uh, secures and enables them to exist. Do you have a plan for that, for that transfer of value from the applications to the... Uh... Yeah, so I mean, that would kind of come back to the monetization stuff that I was talking about before, right? In terms of like capturing some value either from the users of the applications or by uh, like having other applications for the protocols or something like that. Um, and then capturing that value, you could burn the oxen uh, or there are other, other more complicated things that you could do as well. Uh, what's the uh, daily usage of oxen or number of users or do you have any estimate? As the, the currency? Just the, yeah, the actual. I'm actually not sure off the top of my head. But... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so since this is a Monero conference, uh, I want to discuss the way that uh, Oxen differs from Monero. Uh, so for example, one of the uh, founding principles of Monero, so to speak, is you know no dev tax, no pre-mine, no company. You have all three. We do. So can you talk a bit about that? Of course, yeah. Um, I think, once again, Ruben kind of, I get, I think gave a pretty good answer to this exact question. Um, and it's kind of a uh, a product of the reality of the world, right? Like, you need to be able to pay people to develop on these platforms. Uh, Monero absolutely was in a really unique position. Um, and there was kind of, you know, a microcosm at the time, um, which, and they had first mover advantage as well, right? Um, which are things that we didn't have. Uh, so ultimately, yeah, we had an ICO back in 2018, which at the time was a very dirty word, probably in these spaces it still is. Although a lot of the time people will kind of give you a wry smile these days because they're like, holy shit, you actually still exist. It's very surprising you didn't run away with the money or burn it all on some random shit. It doesn't matter. Um, and uh, yeah, we do have the dev tax and we do have the foundation. It's important to note though that the foundation... Uh, it, it doesn't actually have, like the, the actual network is decentralized, right? Like it's within the foundation's constitution. It can never run more than 10% of the network. Um, and people do often ask questions about like the jurisdiction of the foundation is in, right? Being Australian, uh, not-for-profit does invite questions, especially from these communities. Um, but ultimately the foundation doesn't necessarily have to exist for the project to exist, right? And if the foundation for some reason had to dissolve or the entire team just kind of snapped and disappeared off the face of the planet one day, uh, I think that there's enough recognition of the value of things like session that development would continue and support. Continue anyway. Fantastic. I'll open it up to questions. Hi, can you talk, so you're talking about how uh, an advanced paid version of session would allow you get around data limits, but I was thinking, can you just hack together some accounts to get unlimited, unlimited data flow? So the question is, how do you handle DDoS on the session network? Yeah, right. So this is actually a very uh, difficult problem uh, that we've been trying to deal with uh, on session uh, for a long time. I mean, obviously the file transfer limit is one way that we do that. Uh, presumably, uh, if there was like a financial barrier to being able to transfer larger files than that, uh, it would be quite costly to DDoS the network. Um, but we do also have a uh, civil attack problem uh, on session because there is no authentication required to make an account. It's as simple as just generating a key pair, uh, which takes basically no resources whatsoever. We looked into using proof of work to try and mitigate this, but the problem is that you know a, a malicious attacker is likely going to have way more capacity to um, calculate like difficult proofs. Uh, compared to someone who's like using a mobile phone and especially because we're trying we're like say like session is supposed to be usable not only by people you know who have like the latest iPhone but people who maybe have a really like old or low power device uh, that really would mess with their user base it is an ongoing problem uh, my question is kind of a follow-up on this because our major concern is um do you, have you considered using pricing in terms of Oxen in order to access the network? Um, that's, I mean, I, I, I say this because I'm involved with the Monero scaling, actually. And I figure out that for a privacy network, I mean, about the only way to do it that I have come, come across is, is to actually put some pricing involved. Um, small enough that it is it doesn't prevent normal usage, but um, high enough that it will make it very expensive for a spammer. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think we really want to introduce any financial barrier to using the basic features of Session. Uh, like, I I think it would go against the ethos of the application, and as much as we can, we're going to try and find other solutions uh, in order to subsidize those free users, right? Uh, whether it's things like enterprise or other services that we can provide, uh, we're still figuring this out. But um, no, I don't think we'll ever introduce like a, a base cost uh, to use Session or any other application for network, sorry. Uh, I have a technical question. Uh, can I ask technical questions? You could try. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, I hear that you say that you had, uh, the first you had a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake, and then you switched to proof of stake, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, how you mitigate uh, the problem of uh, long range attacks uh, for proof of stake? Uh, this is a question that I do not know the answer to. Okay. Uh, but I think actually Keeb maybe will cover this in his talk. Yeah, it's his talk is literally later okay. today. So okay. come with us. Thank you. I think that's everyone. Let's Great. give it up for Alex.